Job chapter 1 is where we'll be, uh, and we're going to get jump right in. So, 1 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. <clears throat> he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Okay, so setting up the, the, the table, if you will, right? Uh, and it's talking about this guy, Job. So Job is uh, a very, uh, first of all, he's an upright man. It starts off by saying that. And he's a very wealthy man. So back then, in his day, uh, if you were a very wealthy person, you had a lot of servants, a lot of uh, cattle and things like that. Not so much like gold and silver, but uh, things that would actually provide value, like things you could eat and things that you could do stuff with, like donkeys and camels and whatnot. So uh, Job is loaded, and he also has a, a very large family, and that was very beneficial back then, especially to have sons, because sons would carry on the family name. Uh, so, so he also has a large family. Um, and not only is Job a, a godly man, but even his kids appear to be righteous. Um, and when he says, it talks about how he's sacrificing um, the words he's basically saying is like, look, it may, there might be a chance that they didn't sin outwardly, but they sinned in their heart. So just in case, I'm going to sacrifice uh, for them to cover their sins, right? So uh, Job is not only obedient to the Lord, but he's also acting in a, in a high priestly manner towards his family, um, similar to Melchizedek in, in Genesis. So, uh, so, so just the snapshot, Job's a great guy. Uh, and he, not great only in terms of, um, you know, standing with the Lord, but also materially in, in the world's eyes as well. Okay, and then the plot thickens in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to pre present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Uh, this phrase, the sons of God, it's uh, usually from the Hebrew, either B'nai Ach Elohim or B'nai Hel Elohim, uh, refers to a direct creation of God, and uh, it's used in the book of Genesis to refer to spiritual beings, and that's what's going on here. Um, there's, there's angels um, and, and Satan, who is uh, actually described in Ezekiel as a cherub, uh, so they are basically going to, before God to give a report. <clears throat> the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and, f uh, to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. Which is similar to uh, something that First Peter says in First Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So the report that Satan gives is, hey, I've been doing what I do, seeking someone to devour. Verse 8, and the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, and blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil? Uh, so this is kind of interesting. God is, is more or less bragging about Job, right? And uh, that's kind of a mixed, mixed reaction for, from us, right? Because on one hand, he's kind of painting a target on Job, right? And he's like, hey, Satan, you see this guy? Uh, you know, he, this, is my, this is my boy, Job. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> in one sense, you're like, wow, it'd be awesome to see, to, if God were to brag about me before Satan. On the other hand, it's like, yikes. Uh, and we're going to see that in a second. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and on all he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So uh, Satan's basically accusing Job. And he's saying, well, yeah, of course he loves you. He doesn't really love you. He loves the stuff that you give him, right? Um, and if you take away the stuff that you've given him, guess what? He'll, he'll hate you. And that's kind of the, uh, what, what Satan's betting on here. And God says, all right, well, let's put it to the test. And he does indeed. So in verse 13, now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking... 
There came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So Job's just, you know, having a normal day, and all of a sudden, uh, he has servants that come. Uh, you, basically, one after another. It says, like, while the, before the one guy could even finish speaking, another guy came to deliver more bad news. And basically, uh, this is some of the worst news you can get, right? He lost all of his material possessions, as well as his family, which uh, you can imagine um, would be a, a more... I mean, to, to put it lightly, uh, a very difficult thing to go through, right? And now, let's, and this is where we see Job's response, which is, which is pretty amazing. In verse 20, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. So basically, Job... Um, man, it's like, it's super heavy because what's, it, when, thing, when things go wrong in our lives, is, 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 the first, is our first reaction to worship? Maybe not, right? But that's exactly what Job does. And he basically comes to the conclusion, hey, I came into this world with nothing, I'm going out the same way. Um, everything that I had was never really mine, it all belonged to the Lord's. And you know what, if the Lord wants to take it all, wants to give it to me, that, that's up to him, right? Uh, and that's a pretty... You know, that's a pretty hard admission to come to when you're going through uh, a difficult time, right? Um, let's continue in the, chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. So, <laughs> deja vu, right? Same, same exact scenario as before. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. So now God is, is laying on the bragging a little thicker, right? He's like, hey, say, you remember that time you came here and you said if you took away all of his stuff that you'd curse in my face? And then that didn't happen. Remember, do you remember that, Satan? Do you remember that happening, right? Um, so, Satan, so God's literally bragging about Job. And again, like, I don't know. To, to think about God bragging about me is a little too much for me to handle. You know what I mean? Like, it's pretty awesome. And sadly, you know, Job didn't see it at the time, but it was going on. Um, and what's also interesting is how God actually takes more of the responsibility for the downfall of Job. He says, um, even though, I, even though you cited me against him to destroy him without reason, right? So he, 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 he's taking responsibility for what's going on in Job's life. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So now Satan's like, all right, double or nothing, right? Uh, you, you, sure, you took away his stuff, but you, know, you touch him himself. That's what's going to make him do it, because he, he loves himself more than he loves you. This is basically what Satan is, is accusing Job of. And God says, all right, let's see. So Satan went down <clears throat> out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome swords, sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Uh, some of your translations may say boils. These are extremely painful sores, and they cover his entire body, which means that no matter what position he was in, whether he was laying down, sitting down, standing, whatever, uh, he was going to be in agony, right? So uh, this, is, this is, you know, it's not like he just got a sore and it's like, oh, just put some aloe on it or something. No, no, no. Uh, he basically has a, a, he's suffering from an ailment in which there is no respite, right? Uh, so, yeah, not, not easy to deal with. And he took a piece of broken pottery with, <clears throat> with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. And then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. It's like, if you were wondering why Satan didn't take his wife with his family, like, now we know, right? Like, thanks, honey. Appreciate that, right? Like, yeah. Uh, but he, but Job, in verse 10, said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all of this, Job did not sin 
with his lips. So um, again, another like, just extremely remarkable uh, response from Job. In that basic conclusion he comes to is, look, we were, vo- we were all very happy to praise God and to serve him and worship him when things were really good. Um, but what, just because he doesn't do what's, what we think is good, now we're just going to turn from him? Is that how it works? Because this is the thing, if, if you love somebody for what they're doing for you and not for who they are, that means you, you love yourself, right? You don't love that other person. And that's why, uh, you know, if you're looking to get married and um, you ask yourself, well, is this person going to make me happy the rest of my life? Well, that's the wrong question uh, because that means you love yourself. And, uh, and what you should really be asking is, uh, do I want to make this person happy the rest of my life? That's, that's really the better question. So a little, little free marital advice there, uh, which is <laughs> not, not necessarily the point of this, this entire study, but that's okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, the thing about this, too, is that Job, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever gone through difficult experiences. Um, like I was saying before, like, worship is not necessarily always the, the first instinct, right? Because oftentimes we don't feel like worshiping God in those times. There are times where we might feel angry at God or, or questioning him and saying, well, why, why have you done this to me? Or why are you allowing this to happen? Uh, I love this as a quote. I collect quotes, so I'm going to be dropping some quotes on you guys. Uh, Ravi Zagaraya says, I was o- always lean toward the fact that right thinking has to precede right feeling, or else if the felt reality comes first, then the thinking has to be in keeping uh, with what is being felt. So basically what he's saying there is, look, um, the heart will make a convert of the mind, right? And when there are times where our heart, there's, there's head knowledge and there's heart knowledge, right? Um, head knowledge is very intellectual. Heart is more, you know, what we feel and what we experience. And sometimes uh, those two things are at odds with each other, where, you know, our heart is saying, well, I feel like, you know, angry at God, but at the same time I know um, that God is good and that God loves me and things like that. And it's those times where uh, we need to lean more on the truth, uh, on what we know uh, intellectually until the heart can, can come around, Right. Um, and that's more or less, I think, what Job is kind of doing here, because he knows, um, despite his circumstances, that doesn't, that doesn't change who God is, right? But it still gives us a dilemma of, well, okay, what's the deal, right? Because you look at this and you think, that wasn't very nice, God. Like, eh, I wouldn't want God to do that to me. Um, so there, there are basically three directions where bad things come from in our lives, right? Uh, first is from ourselves, right? And that's from sin. We sin, we blow it, and we have to deal with the consequences of those actions, right? Second is other people. So other people sin against us, and we have to deal with the consequences, consequences of other people's actions. And then lastly, there's what you just call like nature or God, right? So uh, earthquakes, diseases, hurricanes, whatever, right? These are things that are out of anybody's control. They happen to us, and we don't like them, but there they are. And for the first one, obviously, like, you know, if, if I make a mistake, who am I going to blame but myself, right? I, I made it myself. I'll just be the knucklehead, right? It's my fault. Uh, it's usually the second other two categories uh, where we encounter them that we start to question, you know, well, is God just? Is God good? Because um, how could God allow these things to happen in my life? And I, you know, I, I listen to a lot of... Um, I listen to a lot of people, especially on YouTube and stuff like that. There's, there's, it's great, man. There's all kinds of lectures you can listen to, and I like to get a, a wide variety of uh, points of view. So I listen to a lot of um, atheist debates and things like that. And one of the things they always come up with is this, uh, basically, this objection to God's morality and, you know, saying that, well, God's not just, God's not moral. And, okay, assuming that God exists, uh, that's a pretty foolish uh, idea to propagate, right, for, for a few reasons. One... Um, so God created the universe, right? And so therefore, it all belongs to him. And if, if everything belongs to God, he can do whatever he wants with it, right? It's like if you were to come to my house and you, you come to the front door and I say, hey, would you mind taking off your shoes because I don't want to get mud in my house? You say, okay, you'd probably be like, yeah, sure, no problem. Take your shoes off. Now, if, I, if you were to invite me over to your house and all of a sudden I was like, hey, can you take your shoes off? I don't want to get mud in the car, but you'd be like, Ben, this is my house. I'll get mud on my own carpets if I darn well please, right? Like, that would be kind of weird to have somebody tell you that. Why? Because it's, it belongs to you. It's yours. You get to decide what, what happens there. Um, and so there's that, right? So God, it's his universe. He ultimately gets to decide what's right and wrong and, and what happens in that universe, right? Secondly, uh, what we need to also understand is that God is way smarter than you, okay? Like, way smarter. Um, you guys, I don't know if you've ever taken calculus, like, Okay, a few people. Uh, God, yeah, a few people. Congratulations, calculus people. Um, 
Like, you got to understand something. Like, God wrote that, right? Like, they, and, they're, and that's just like, I mean, I took that in high school. There are things that I couldn't even hope to, like, understand, right? Like, laws of physics and law, other laws of mathematics and, you know, all the stuff that goes on. DNA. Like, we, there are so many things that we're still trying to, like, wrap our minds around and try to figure out, like, what is going on here? Um, even the top scientists don't even know, right? Um, so, but God designed all of that, right? He was one who thought it up and, and made it happen. So, uh, that being said... Uh, he, he's way smarter than any of us hope to be, right? Not only that, but he's also more knowledgeable. God is outside of time and space, and so he sees the end from the beginning. So he knows exactly what's going to go on, whereas we, we take our steps through life one at a time, uh, and we don't see the end, right? We don't see what's coming. God sees it all. So that being said, um, like, if you think you know better than God, what's right and what's wrong. I'd say you're a little out of luck uh, because I think God's way smarter than you and, and he knows more. And lastly, uh, God created the universe. He created stars. Like, he doesn't sweat you. You can fight God if you want, but bad news, you're not going to win. Uh, so why, why bother, right? So um, trying to question God's morality and, and things is, is, is just, uh, it goes nowhere, basically. And you have to think, like, um, okay, Let's just say like God showed up to you in a vision, right, in glory and power, and he says, I want you to go through this very difficult thing, um, and there's going to be rewards for you afterward if you go through it. You'd be like, okay, yeah, sure. See God, you know, in his, all of his glory and power, you'd be like, okay, God, you asked me to do this? Sure. Uh, the question is, what happens if God doesn't ask you to do it, if he just puts you in the, in the situation? And, um, and the same deal, I mean, hey, if you go through this, this situation and you glorify God, you, there will be rewards. Um, how would you feel about that? And the answer is, I mean, like, that's, that's what happens with all of us. Very rarely, I can tell you, God's never showed up to me in a vision of any kind that, I, that I'm aware of anyway. Um, and most of you probably are in the same boat as me. Uh, but all of us, we live our lives, and um, God has selected us to live our lives, um, you know, to be in this, this specific time, a specific place. And that's the, that's the situation, right? God is... is even though we may not see God in all of his power and glory asking us to step into some of these things, that's, that's the situation that we find ourselves in, whether we believe it or not. Um, and the thing about it is that Job didn't know that there was going to be a book written about him, right? This book was written for our benefit, and I have to assume that if you read the whole book, you'll see that you know, there's a happy ending at the end, and Job maintains his uh, you know, commitment to God. And I have to assume that there are going to be some pretty awesome rewards in store for Job because of, of the situation that he went through. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9, Paul speaks about some of these rewards. Because um, you may ask, well, how good are these rewards? Well, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Basically what Paul is saying is like, you want to know about the rewards of God, the things that he has in store for you? Well, you've never seen anything like it. You've never heard of anything like it. You've never even thought of anything as good as what God has in plan uh, for you. Um, again, for those who love him, right? Those who obey him. And, uh, and that's really what's at stake here for Job. It's not that he's suffering arbitrarily, even though Job doesn't know why at the time. Um, there's a reason for it. And ultimately, it's, it's for our benefit. And what I find really interesting is when you think about Job, when you look at his life, Job says in, the, in chapter 1, it says he was a servant of God. Uh, he suffered, not for any wrongdoing that he committed, but for the benefit of others. And the question is, who else does that sound like? Sounds like Jesus. And so Job is a, is a type of Christ in that regard. And that's, that's, the, that's the calling for all of us, right? Is to live the life of Christ, to be like Christ. And... Uh, so oftentimes we ask God, like, hey, make me, mold me into the image of Christ. Make me more like Christ. And that's not always the way. It, just, it doesn't just work that way, right? God's not just like, okay, great, Christ, done. Um, there's a, a terrible movie with a great quote. Uh, it's called Evan Almighty. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. I, I wasn't a big fan of the movie. I'm sorry if you liked it. Moving on. Uh, there's a scene. There's one part I did really like about it. And there's a scene where Morgan Freeman is portraying God. And uh, there's this woman who's basically... Ask, she wants to be more, she wants more courage. And she asks, she's asking God for more courage. And Morgan Freeman basically looks at her and says, listen, when, when God, oh, now, now I'm going to butcher this quote. Um, but basically what he says, look, when you ask God for courage, does God just give you more courage or does he put you in situations where you get to be courageous? 
And I think that's very true. Um, and I think that, you know, we ask to be more like Christ. We ask God to continually mold us into his image. But I don't think it just happens. I think God gives us uh, opportunities to be like Christ. And, and part of that is suffering, right? Suffering, um, but still um, following after God and going through that. So, um, yeah, not to quote Evan Almighty. I hate, I'm, I'm not a big fan of quoting movies, but yet they work sometimes. So, um, yeah, so there's, there's, and so another thing we take comfort in is knowing that when we go through difficult times, uh, God's not going to give us more than we can handle, right? In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul writes, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. In Psalm 103, David writes, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. In Isaiah 42, 3, he writes, A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. This is what you've got to understand. God knows you, and God sees you, uh, and he sees your circumstances, and he knows what you're capable of, and he knows what you are not capable of, and he knows all of these things better than you do, way better, right? And so God is going to put us in situations where we feel like, oh, I can't endure this. I can't go through this. This is going to be too hard for me. And uh, the thing about it is like God, God knows what you're able to do, right? And God's not going to put you through something that uh, that you can't handle. He's going to make a way. And that oftentimes, if not all the time, relies on us leaning on the Lord, right? Um, and relying on him to, to be gracious to us, to get us through those experiences. Um, but there's never an excuse for, for turning away from him, right? For saying, forget this. I'm going and doing my own thing. Because God always makes a way. And uh, we can also take comfort in the, in the fact that um, God is not just this drill sergeant, right, who expects us just to do our duty. Um, he loves us. He loves us immensely. In Romans 5, 8, Paul writes, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps it, for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Um, God does not simply call us to walk through the suffering alone. He himself has walked through the suffering in, through Christ, right? Christ has walked through the suffering. Not only that, but he, he loves us. Um, and I, if you guys remember my last, last time I was up here talking, talking about how um, it's often harder to watch somebody go through suffering that you love than just going through the suffering yourself, right? That's a, that's a very true thing. And so I don't think we understand how much suffering God has actually endured. I don't know that we have the capacity to. Um, and why? It's, it's because he loves us, right? Um, so, so this, was, this message is supposed to be like a, a personal thing, uh, something that was personal to us. And uh, this was personal. This, there's a reason this message is kind of personal to me. So I went through a, a difficult time uh, when I was first year of college. Um, I had a, a really close friend. Um, she had, basically what happened was she had leukemia for a number of years and um, she ended up coming uh, to our youth group after like a bone marrow plant transplant. She was away for, she was actually in like seclusion for like a year because of it. And uh, she started coming back to youth group and uh, my mom, who was uh, helping out the youth group, also had a spiritual gift of finding people who needed friends and then guilt tripping me into becoming their friends, right? So, uh, so that happened a lot. And so she came to youth group, she's like, hey, she needs a friend, go be your friend. I'm like, all right. So I did, but we ended up becoming really good friends, actually. And uh, over the years, we um, started hanging out in the same circle of friends. Uh, we ended up going to my school's version of the prom, uh, a banquet, whatever, but not getting too deep into that. Um, and eventually, we found out that she, uh, she had beaten leukemia, but then she developed lung cancer. And she ended up passing away my first year, end of my first year of college. And, like... Um, she was like a little, like she's around my age. She was probably a little younger than me, but um, yeah, like I said, we, we were just really good friends. And it's those moments, when, especially death, when we're confronted with death, that's where you really get confronted with, hey, what do I believe, right? Uh, it's like a roller coaster. I remember going on a roller coaster one time. You, you, like, I don't think they make roller coasters the same way they used to, where it's a nice big hill and it gives you a lot of time to think on the way up. And you're like, hmm, like, 
this coaster, like, not that I think it's going to, like, crumble beneath me, but if it did, I'd be pretty much dead, right? Because I put all of my weight, all of my trust in this. Um, and not, again, not that I think that it's going to cave in or anything like that, but if it did, I'd be toast. And I, I definitely had one of those experiences where I started to really think, like, wow, I put all of my eggs in this one basket, which is Christ, right? And, again, not that I really doubted it, but it made me think and it made me evaluate um, you know, do I really believe this? And it was, a hard, it was a hard thing. I mean, I was, I don't know if I'd say like depressed, but I was grieving for a while. And it lasted a good amount of time. And um, I just remember coming to the conclusion eventually, because it was like, okay, we're, there's a quote, another quote. I'm going to drop another quote by G.K. Chesterton, which says, when belief in God becomes difficult, the tendency is to turn away from him, but in heaven's name, to what? And that was the situation I found myself in. I was like, where, where am I going to turn? Um, you know, I believe that Christ died and, and, and rose from the dead. Um, that, that, to me, seemed like a fact. And, you know, where, where, where was I going to go? And, when I, and I came to some of the same conclusions that Job does in here, where it's like, hey, you know what? Maybe God has a plan for all of this. Maybe, um, despite the fact that this is difficult, maybe God uh, has something in mind for all of this, and um, and it, that, it was at that moment that I turned to God, and I just I just started to worship, and that was the thing, that was the real thing that I that I learned through that experience is that you know, the moments when when we come with our hurt, with our pain, with our the things we're worrying about, all of those all of those things, and we bring them to God's feet, like. And we, and we just worship God. Because listen, it doesn't matter what we do or what we go through. It doesn't change who God is. God is still God. He's still powerful. He's still great. He's good. He's loving. He's merciful. He's gracious. All of those things. And despite the fact that we go through difficult circumstances, none of that changes. And I realized that. And it was in that moment um, when, uh, of just worshiping God, whether I was alone in my room or gathered with other believers singing praises to God. Like, it was in those moments that I found the greatest amount of comfort and rest from, from what I was going through. And for you guys, um, you know, I would just encourage you, if you're going through something difficult, if you're um, ever in one of those situations, if you're not, thank God, it's coming. Don't worry, you'll get there. It happens to all of us, right? But know that, it, you know, if you need rest, um, you need to come to God, and it's in, in worshiping Him and just admitting the truth of how great He is and, and what He's done for us. It's in those moments that we find our greatest, our greatest comfort and rest. One of my favorite Christian artists of all time is a guy named Rich Mullins. Quote him all the time. What can I say? I love him. Uh, he has a, a song, and, he, and it goes like this. I'm not going to sing it, thankfully, uh, but I am going to read it. There's a wideness in God's mercy I cannot find in my own, and he keeps his fire burning to melt this heart of stone, keeps me aching with a yearning, keeps me glad to have been caught, in the reckless raging fury that they call the love of God. Now I've seen no band of angels, but I've heard the soldier's song. Love hangs over them like a banner. Love within them leads them on to the battle, on the journey, and it's never going to stop, ever widening their mercies and the fury of his love. This is, this, is the real, this is the real kicker. Joy and sorrow are this ocean, and in their every ebb and flow, now the Lord a door has opened that all hell could never close. Here I'm tested and made worthy, tossed about but lifted up in the reckless raging fury that they call the love of God. 